The reading this morning is quite lengthy. It starts at Luke chapter 3, verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iteria and Traconicus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all God's people will see, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you, were than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be c with content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptise you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Now Luke chapter 9 verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading to Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And from Luke chapter 29, verse 49, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and what restraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share God's word uh, with you folk uh, on this day. We're heading uh, towards uh, one of the peak periods in the church calendar, which is Pentecost. And uh, I thought it would be appropriate over these couple of weeks as we come to Pentecost Sunday in a few weeks to 
look at a couple of perspectives on Pentecost and how we get there to step up towards Pentecost as we go towards it. Uh, that amazing uh, occasion that we celebrate and of which in which we live ourselves today. And so this week I want to look at uh, some of Luke's teaching about the Holy Spirit and next week uh, look at a key chapter in John's Gospel which is probably the most dense teaching on uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, in the New Testament. So uh, that's next week. Luke's interest is historical. He likes to tell his theology in a narrative form and sprint it out bit by bit in a story. And uh, as you piece the story pieces together, you'll get the drift of what he's saying about the Holy Spirit. Whereas John is more philosophical uh, and he likes to look at the essences of things. And uh, that's where we're looking next week. But the Holy Spirit himself in uh, this book and uh, in this story uh, really is the marker uh, of the change in history. This is the marker of God that salvation history is stirring. And it's the Spirit who is like the advanced organiser for the coming of Christ. And you know the stories, the birth stories of Christ, and we have the stories of John and Jesus, both angelic interventions. Jesus being born of the Spirit. John is filled with the Spirit from birth, whatever that means. And uh, this is a, a new thing. And then when they're a little bit older, there are prophecies made in the temple of God, in the presence of God, by certain uh, amateur prophets and prophetesses about these figures. Uh, things are stirring. You see, th there hasn't been much said for about 300 years. No canonical prophets have been around. It's been just oppression, Greeks and then Romans and not much else. And now the spirit is stirring out of the blue. And this really hits us in this story when we read that in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, some pretty important people, a whole lot of dignitaries are named, and we won't go through it here, but the text points out that in God's economy, the word of the Lord did not come to any of the dignitaries or the high priests of Annas and Caiaphas. It came to an oddball called John, who was filled with the spirit from birth, and he was out in the wilderness and the word of God came to John. John did not take the initiative to start a ministry. The word of God started this ministry and prompted John to speak forth. The son of Zechariah was in the wilderness and he went into the region around the Jordan and here is his message. It says he proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. He proclaimed an action. Fascinating. But the action that he proclaimed was self-explanatory in, in and of itself. To, to engage in John's baptism was to understand both the sinner and salvation. He, he asks people, and we know that the era, area in which he is working and operating, he's doing this baptism, is over on the east side, on the pagan side of Judea, the Jordan, near uh, its southern point. And uh, this is where John is operating. So if someone, a Jewish person from Judea or Galilee, and people came from all over, John was massive in his charisma and his pulling power. You wouldn't have found hardly a soul in Judea who had not heard about John and who did not believe that in some sense John was a prophet of God out of the blue. And so they flocked in droves to, to John and he was demanding that Jews be baptised. Now that in itself is an audacious thing. Effectively John is saying, you Jews have got to cash in your old currency because it doesn't stand for anything. You've got to regard yourselves as aliens and if you're going to come into the holy land or the kingdom of God, you need cleansing. That's what they're doing. To submit to John's baptism was to admit 
that you don't have any rights to be in the kingdom of God. And yet people were. You, you couldn't depend on your birth or your lineage and who you were descended from or what land your people owned. All that currency was defunct. And this is what John is preaching. And it's an admission that they were not worthy of the kingdom of God. <laughs> they were to come into the kingdom of God on God's terms. And, and this is backed up. People sh shouldn't have been surprised because the prophet Isaiah in verse 4 we read, he himself had said the voice of one crying in the wilderness, John. He operated in the wilderness. He said, prepare the way of the Lord, make his way paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, those things which were ashamed of shall be brought up. Every mountain, those things we're proud of, shall be brought down. And the crooked will become straight and the rough places will be leveled because there's a pathway becoming here that God is going to walk upon. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. There's a little message in here for those of us who are interested in revival. And goodness, don't we need it? Doesn't this society need it? But the truth of John is that revival begins with the household of God. Revival is what God first does to the church. They have to make their paths straight. They have to get ready for an exposure to the presence of God. And that requires a deep-seated repentance. And then the world will see the, founder, the salvation of God. There has not been a revival which just touched the unsaved. It comes out of a revived church. And so John says these crowds that come to be baptised him, this guy needs a little bit of coaching, don't you think? He, he gets his audience and he calls them a brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You see, John is so aware of the holiness of God that if God comes into Judea and into Israel in its current state of corruption and, and, and slackness, then Israel doesn't stand a chance in the presence of that majesty and that holiness of God. They better get ready. This is an urgent message. It's not a pleasant message. And John is not interested in the size of the crowd. He thins the crowd. He calls them a lot of snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He sees these people as somehow revival groupies who are going for the next spiritual experience. And instead he tells them to bear fruit in, 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 in keeping with repentance, to display lifestyle attitudes that really match repentance. And don't tell me, he says, that you've got Abraham for your father. That is, don't depend on the old covenant. He will not tolerate, John will not tolerate nominal faith, civic faith that you're a member of a Christian country or a Jewish country in this case. We have Abraham. I tell you, God's able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones here in, in this deserted place. And even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees, and every tree that doesn't bear fruit, just like every farmer knows, is cut down and thrown to the fire. And so the crowd's asking, Well, what does repentance look like? And he runs through this private property, has to be rethought. Those of you who've got surplus have to share with those who have less. Tax gatherers were a complete rort. The public service was absolutely corrupt in Judea. And if you had the capacity to tax, you would outsource that and you'd sell your rights to others who became tax farmers. And so consequently, everyone was paying more tax than they ever legally needed to. It was absolutely corrupt. And the soldiers here who supported the tax gatherers would use their power and authority to extort wealth out of people. That's the sort of country... Do you reckon God invented Israel to look like that? That was never his plan. And that's why these people are in need of repentance before the coming of God on that highway, this one who is to come, who was prophesied. And they ask him, what do we do? And he gives them direct uh, instructions. 
And the people are so impressed that, and here is the crux of the message today where we come to, they think surely the Messiah couldn't be more significant than this figure. We've never seen anyone like this. This has to be the Messiah. And John picks up on the gossip. He knows what's being said. And he said, are you kidding? <coughs> he cannot be the Christ. For one thing, I baptise you with water. But he who is coming is mightier than I in terms of power. The strap of his sandal I'm not worthy to untie. Even the most menial task he cannot uh, compare. That would be too grand for him just to be a, a boot stutter in the team of God. And uh, he, on, by, by terms of honour, you've got no idea. I cannot be the Messiah. And furthermore, I baptise you with water. The medium of ministry is entirely different. Mine is totally symbolic and outward. But he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he goes on, verse 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand. What, what does that come from? It's an another agrarian image of a farmer after the harvest who tosses, and it still happens in, in third world countries today, tosses the grain into the air and the wind on a windy day blows the chaff away and the, the seed falls. He separates. And it's a picture of separation. It's a picture of judgment. I baptise with water, but he who is mightier than is coming and he's... The strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy of. He will baptise you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, John is the originator of this phrase, baptism in spirit. It's been misused in our church in recent years terribly. It has nothing the way we use it. We use it about an ecstatic Christian experience. That's not how John is using it, is it? John is speaking about separation about something urgent, about God's judgment. It's not something about some warm feeling inside a saint. This is literally what these people would have heard when John said, I'm baptising you with Holy Spirit and fire. Literally, they would have heard, he, he will, not I will, he will baptise you in, he will baptise means to plunge. He will plunge you into the fiery breath of God. How do you reckon you're going to go? That's what John is saying. When this one comes, he will plunge you into the fiery breath of God. And that is not a pleasant individualistic experience. This is what Israel is going to go through. A separation where the genuine will be separated from the, the fake. And God will be doing this work when he comes... And it says, isn't it astonishing? And so with many other exhortation, he preached the good news to the people. So that's good news. <laughs> You've got to ask, what's the bad news? <laughs> but, but you see, it is good news. I mean, do you think medically, when you go to a doctor, the good news is the truth about your condition. You do not pay the bill to a medical specialist, no matter how many gongs they've got after their name, if when you're sitting down there and you say, well, what do the x-rays show? What's, what's wrong with me, doctor? He says, what do you want me to tell you? <laughs> what will cheer you up? You should be out of that office straight away. And yet that is what the medics in the church tell people today. There are people who are more intent on giving people the wrong sort of news, a misdiagnosis of their condition, than to tell them the truth that they urgently need to know. Uh, we have friends who are always downloading terrible ideas off the internet. Uh, and one of our friends was telling us in our Bible study group the other night that uh, she's got this new thing she tries where... When she gets into a good conversation with people, she says, can I pray a blessing on you? And people often say, well, why not? And people are quite... And she thinks this is really good because people think positively about the church. 
but they should be thinking negatively about themselves. And we preach this gospel, which we have no mandate to preach, rather than telling people where they really stand right this minute, if Christ came, if the Spirit of God enveloped this place, where do you stand? Not under blessing, but under curse. It's a misdiagnosis that we have no authority to teach. I have another, well, he used to be a friend until we were conversing on Facebook, and he's quite a famous evangelist. From time to time, he's not a particularly good theologian, but he, he's popular. And uh, he was putting this idea out the other day that, hey, try this one on for size. What he does now, and it is hard, evangelism is hard. People are hardened. That's what a sinner is. They don't want to know how they stand with God, and they don't like being called sinners. So he uses this new line where he goes up to these people and he suggests, and it's not original, and it should be put to death, it's the idea that he says, I can see the Holy Spirit in you. Because everyone today is, everyone today is interested in spirituality. And I happen to put on his line, um, I don't think so. That's actually untrue. And what are you going to do? Say they do meet the Holy Spirit later on and they receive the Holy Spirit. How are you going to explain what you've been saying? They'll never trust you. Because you cannot have the Holy Spirit apart from redemption. The Holy Spirit cannot live with unholiness. He will not indwell a life for their sake. <laughs> If the Holy Spirit inhabited the life of a sinner, it will be death to the sinner. We've got to understand that the coming of the Holy Spirit is firstly about holiness and God's desire to live with his people has been thwarted by sin. We have no right to teach a false gospel. That's one temptation. It's a false form of revival if we have people coming into the church on that basis. They will not be saved. But that's not what John preached. He preached good news, the truth. He got people ready and he called for repentance in preparation for the coming of the Lord. The other thing which we must not miss in this passage is that the Holy Spirit and the ministry of Christ are like that. I think one of the errors of today is that we sort of think we know about Easter and Christmas and the ministry of Christ and resurrection, ascension, end of story. Now the interesting stuff is the Holy Spirit. Uh-uh. The ministry of Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is the medium of the Son of God. He obeys the dictates of the Father and the Son. And it's the coming of the Son who wields the Spirit. It's the Spirit who leads the Son through his ministry and empowers him. And we read a little bit later in this chapter, if you read on, you'd read about his baptism, that he is filled with the Spirit at that point and led into the wilderness right there. But this is inextricable. If we separate the Spirit from Christ, we're liable to tell a false gospel. Because the coming of the Son meant judgment for the people of God. Now I think, this is why we jump to that next little passage in Luke 9. Suddenly there's a twist in the ninth chapter and John has Jesus set out on a trip from the north to the south. In reality, Jesus had been going like this, up and down through Samaria and da 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 and on the way from the north through the south, they go through the midsection, which is Samaria. And you know about Samaritans and Jews. They have history. They don't get on. They despise each other with good reason. Long-standing bitterness exists. And so they're coming through and they come to a particular village and word gets out that this Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. So <laughs> no go. They offer him no hospitality. And the disciples' reaction, what is their reaction? Their reaction is, hey, is this the time? How about you, the boys and I 
call down fire from heaven upon these Samaritans. <laughs> let's, let's heat them up a bit. <laughs> That's what they're... Now, obviously, the disciples have been listening to John. Obviously, they've probably been baptised by John and have heard the message about plunging into the fiery breath of God, that the coming of the Spirit will be a purging experience for Israel. And so they think, hey, like they consider themselves little messiahs, that they can command the spirit. Watch out for anyone who thinks they've got the authority over the Holy Spirit. That is not a biblical concept. And they want to call down fire and consume them. See, that's the opposite error to the first error that we looked at a moment ago, where we try and include everyone and separate no one. Here, yeah, these people, these Samaritans, are regarded as unworthy, unholy, and the disciples want to condemn them, put them in the too hard basket. God can't work with them. They want judgment now in the form of the coming of the Spirit. <laughs> Give me a little taste of the Spirit. That's what they're saying. But Jesus rebukes them. That is not the mandate of the church, is to work out who is in and who is out, and to pronounce condemnation on any group. Isn't it an astonishing thing? I just think it's a remarkable thing. I had a, a chaplain when I was at school. who was a great missionary in India for many years until he became quite ill and then became a chaplain for donkey's years in our school. That chaplain, Harry, used to pray for every child in that school as they went through. And those of us who came to the Lord during his ministry... He kept on praying. I was amazed how much detail Harry knew about my life when I'd bump into him. 20 years later, 25 years later, when I went to theological college, he'd become the chaplain of that theological college. And he was up to date. That was a prayer life. And I'm amazed in life. Harry was not a person that is ever going to have a book written about him. But I'm amazed at the number of people that I went to school with and I was afraid of. The head of the karate club, outright thugs. And I bump into these people at school programs and in Vic Market and that and I think, goodness, it's Rodney. <laughs> you were never safe around Rodney in the school swimming pool or the change rooms. Uh -uh. But now Rodney is going to a church in Doncaster. <laughs> Now let's put that down to something. What has happened here? The Lord is able to raise up children of Abraham from the most hardened surfaces. We never should put anyone in the too hard basket. And then lastly, we move through Luke and we come to this funny little passage in Luke chapter 12, verses 49 to 53. And again, it's a chapter where Jesus speaks about the impact of his ministry. It is not all one big happy family. In 51 to 53, he says, you know, you reckon I came to bring peace on the earth? You know, isn't that amazing that in this culture, that's what we want in a leader? That's what we want in a prime minister? You can't be divisive. Now, what a dumb mandate that is. I mean... Everyone disagrees. We're not on the same page and we're often working at cross purposes. How much more in a family? And Jesus is a realist here and he says, you know, my impact upon family life won't be mindfulness and cuddliness. I'll be divisive. That's what happens when holiness steps in. and It's a, it's a higher allegiance than even the family that is separating this. But the thing I want to point out is what he says here. He says, I came to cast fire on the earth. Now that'll, <laughs> do you reckon that'll sell? I want to put that out on the signboard on Elga Road. <laughs> Come and watch Jesus cast napalm on Box Hill, on Elga Road. But that's what he comes to do. And he says, oh, I wish it was already kindled. But what's he talking about? He says, and I think he might have said this more than once, I have a baptism to be baptised with. 
hold on, but he'd already been baptised in the Jordan back in Luke 3. And he's still got a baptism to come. I have a baptism to be baptised. So he's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about him. He is to be plunged into the fiery, holy breath of God. The Son. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Astonishing to think that the Lord Jesus spent every day dreading the future. But he did. This is telling us something remarkable. That God's holiness in the form of the Holy Spirit when he comes at Pentecost, it is an incredibly dangerous and risky venture for God to step in and have anything to do with what is ungodly and unholy, us. But God, knowing this, has sent his Son and got us ready for this coming of the Son. And the Son is willing to take our charge sheet upon his own record. The plunging into the fiery breath of God is Calvary. It is what happens when God unleashes himself on God, the Son. When the Father finally expresses his revulsion and incompatibility with human sin. That is what Jesus experiences. He has the ultimate baptism in spirit we're not talking about his power we're talking about his obedience in terms of accepting the fiery breath of God so that we can come and access this Holy Spirit we begin as we come into Pentecost to first think seriously about the perilous state of we are in if we're unprepared to meet God. John began with urgency, but these Jesus complements John's ministry by preaching a ministry of substitution, that he will step in and bear the heat for us. That is the God we worship. And this way, the God who is the creator will finally get a people of God who reflect his holiness. That's what he's after. Since Adam, through John, through Christ, you are it. You are the best God can do and wants to do. You are God's reclamation of the children of Adam. You're living in the zone of the spirit and you're safe to tell the tale. Not because of your holiness, but because Christ was plunged into the holy breath of God for you. He took the heat that you might see the light. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that in this place and this time we have an incredible privilege to mix with the holiness of God and to be able to live to tell the tale. We thank you, Father God, that though you are infinitely holy, infinite not just in power but in purity, You've worked out a way that you can fellowship with us and not just be in our presence, but live within us. We thank you, Father God, for this baptism of the Spirit which Jesus went through, that we might be this day the new paradigm, holy people of God. We can only say thank you, Lord, and amen.